Raised by wolves with canine DNA in his blood. Having trained more than 24,000 pets. Helping you and your fur babies thrive. Live in studio with Will Bangura. Answering your pet behavior and training questions. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host and favorite pet behavior expert, Will Bangura. Would you like to go on? Good Saturday morning, dog lovers. I'm Will Bangura. And I'm Jordan Marsteller. And you're watching another episode of Dog Training Today here on Facebook Live. Um, just a little bit about myself if you're brand new. I am a clinical animal behaviorist as well as a certified uh, canine behavior consultant, a certified professional dog trainer. I'm also Fear Free certified. And on Dog Training Today, we talk about everything dog training, everything dog behavior. And this is an opportunity. If you have a question about your dog's training, if you've got a question about your dog's behavior, we're here to help you and to give you some expert answers, expert solutions to what you can do, what you can try to have a better relationship and a better behaved dog. Um, and so if you've got a question about your dog's training or behavior, do us a favor. Go ahead and just type that question down into the comments there. And Jordan will be taking a look at those questions. And if you do have questions, we will be doing our best to answer those for you. Um, hey, how was everybody's 4th of July? Did everybody have a good 4th? Hopefully it was safe. Yeah. Um, how, did, how did your pets do with the fireworks? Yeah. yeah. You know? And you know, what I'm, you know what my question is, Will, about what, the 4th what, of July? What's How that? many digits <clears throat> were lost this oh, 4th of no. July. Oh, yeah. yeah you know? Yeah. It, all, it always happens. Somebody blows their hand off. Absolutely. Up. Absolutely. And you know what? My my thoughts and prayers go out to those of you that are less than 10 uh, this morning. Um, less but, than 10 digits. Yeah. Yeah. I They do go out. They do go out to you. But I want to know those statistics. I really do. I really yeah. do. But you know what? You know what's insane? I actually let me see if I can find it. The uh, Arizona Humane Society already released this year's numbers about an increase um, for uh, the Fourth of July intakes. Yeah, it, it, you know it's always a a big. Well, it's the busiest day for any shelters for rescue organizations. Um, yeah. it, it's an absolute. It's an absolute yeah. mess. Yeah, they absolutely. so they they said that it's uh, it's too soon to tell for this year, but they should know in the next couple of days. But they're expecting at least a sixty percent increase, which is about on par with uh, previous years. That's uh, that's crazy. Sixty percent increase for one day of the year. Yeah, it, it, that's absolutely <laughs> yeah. uh, absolutely crazy. So. Today, stay with us because a little bit later in the show, we're going to be talking about the biggest lie in dog training. Okay, the biggest lie in dog training. So don't go anywhere. But first, do us a favor. Hit that like button. Hit that share button. Uh, please give us some love. By doing that, more people get to benefit from what we're doing here at Dog Training Today. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, do us a favor. Hit the like button as well. And please make sure that you subscribe and click on that uh, little bell. Is it the bell on YouTube? Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, uh, yeah. Yeah. On YouTube. Yeah. It's a on YouTube, bell. it's a we little also, bell. And yeah, that, we, that lets people know when we go ahead and post um, a new video. And if you are listening to the Dog Training Today podcast, maybe you listen on Apple Podcasts, maybe you listen on Spotify, do us a favor, just, just hit pause, hit pause and give us a five-star review. If you love what we do, please give us a five-star yeah, review. Do. That helps our rankings um, it helps go us. up. Go Listen, up. guys, if to be frank, if you have gotten anything out of watching our videos or listening to our podcast and you believe that somebody else needs to hear this information, 
like and share the page. It is the only way that we get out there. It's the only way that more people get this free training. We love to do this. We really, really do. And we're doing it because we want to help people. We can only help people if you help us do that. So please take some time to do that for us. You know, you know what's insane though, Will, talking about Fourth of July? Yeah, what's that? Um, so I spent I spent Fourth of July. Uh, me and my fiance went over to Will's house for yeah, uh, the Fourth of yeah. July. It was a, it was a fantastic time. We had some burgers and steaks Goodies. and Goodies. and you know just great food. And Hana yeah. Hana made those brownies that were to die for. Um, but what was crazy? What was crazy was when the first fireworks went off. So we're just sitting there. We're just we're just sitting at the table. I think that maybe we had just finished eating uh, our um, our steaks. Yeah, we had just finished eating our steaks, and the fireworks started going off. And both of your dogs, Boo and Papa Sully, they just came running, just out of nowhere, ran right up to will guys it was it was insane i wasn't even i wasn't even registering what was happening but i noticed it and will goes he goes what are you guys why are you guys coming up to me yeah and then it clicked and then it clicked that it's because he's been doing the conditioning that we've been teaching you guys let me tell you it 100 percent in action i witnessed it obviously i've seen other dogs do this before but i'm telling you guys it works Every single time that those fireworks went off, instead of these dogs who in the past would be scared and they would get startled and maybe they'd go hide or they'd tremble uncontrollably. Instead, they heard the boom from the fireworks and they were like, oh, let me get to dad or let me get to mom or let me get to this person. Let me find someone that's going to give me treats. Yeah. And and so, you know, the funny thing was I forgot they came running up to me and like, what are you guys (laughs) doing? You know, Um, forgot that the previous two years, every time there was a sound of fireworks, I would mark and reward my dogs. And so now They've got a secondary reward marker, yeah. and that's the sound of fireworks because exactly. that means good things are going to happen. And exactly. just like you said, Jordan, um, my dogs really had it pretty severe. I mean, yeah. trembling, hiding, running, trying to get away. Um, it wasn't good. And so yeah. I had to do the work. I had to do the counter conditioning. Um, I had to do the desensitization. And yeah, it was funny because he came running up to me and, and I'm like, well, what are you guys jumping on me for? What, what is it that you need? What is it that you want? And it was Hana. My yeah, wife, it was Hana. It she was remembered. Hana. She goes, yeah. you, you, you got to give him a, a reward. And I forgot. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. We did counter conditioning and desensitization. That's so right. it does. It, it works. Anybody that says it doesn't work, it works. Um, so here's the deal. If you have a dog that struggles with fireworks, chances are the next time it's going to happen is New Year's. Absolutely. Um, You've got a lot of time right now between now and New Year's to be able to do behavior modification, to do counter conditioning, desensitization to fireworks. Yeah. Okay. Um, Between now and then. So let me tell you guys. Six months, six months until New Year's and six months is the average time that we would spend with our clients fixing very severe problems. Yeah, it would have to be very severe for six months. Because here's the thing with my dogs and the, um, um, well, here's exactly the process I went through for two years was a medicate my dogs because they're scared. They don't need to suffer. Okay. So that took the edge off that allowed me during the fireworks to be able to do the work. Yeah. You know, if your dog is so scared that they're constantly running away, trembling, hiding, you can't do the work. First of all, right. they're over threshold. They're over threshold. But what I want everybody to do, if you've got a dog that's afraid of fireworks, okay, you've got six months to get ready for New Year's. You've got a year to get ready for the next 4th of July. Yeah. Go to my website at Dog Behaviorist. There it is. Dogbehaviorist.com. <laughs> Other side? 
Yep, there we go. <laughs> really? Because on my yep. screen, on my screen, it's over there. <laughs> yeah. Okay, nope. I'm going to have to <laughs> use that mir- mirroring feature. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> go to dogbehaviorist.com. Apparently, it's over there. <laughs> yep. And, and go to the menu. Click on articles. There's about 94 articles up there. Find the one on 4th of July fireworks. But yep. also scroll down. Get the big guide on counter conditioning and desensitization. Start working on that now. I guarantee if you follow those guidelines, it's going to be a game changer. Yeah. An absolute game changer for you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Um, So one of the things that I wanted to do today, as I mentioned, and as, um, I wrote in kind of the description for today's podcast, I wanted to talk about the biggest lie in dog training. Okay. Ah, And and the the biggest lie is that anybody's better than us, right? Hey, there, there's, uh, I'm going (laughs) to look at, there's plenty of trainers that are are, better than there are. There are. I I guarantee absolutely are. (laughs) Um, There are, but here, here, here's, you want to talk about a lie. Here you go. Listen to this. There is a radical lie going around the internet on dog training. I am saying the use of aversives, the use of corrections, the use of information in training a dog is necessary. Anyone who tells you anything else is lying to you. Science has no place in dog training. Whoa! What was Whoa. that? Science has no place what? in dog training. What? Yeah. Science has made me the dog trainer and behavior specialist that I am today. So without, without science, I don't know where I'd be today. (laughs) So what Um, teaching, there's nothing behind teaching and educating and how animals think they learn, they process information as far as science, but here's the lie. And that's from Robert Cabral. And Robert was doing a workshop at a shelter. Okay. And he's talking about, you have to use corrections. Let's just listen to a little bit of this and then we'll talk about it, okay? All right. All right. So in, in understanding the makeup of the dog, which is the real, the predator, the wolf, we have to look at why dogs do certain things and why they don't. So if we look at the aspect of positive training or a reward-based system, as I said, as long as the dog's desire for the object, the positive object, the reward object, is greater than its natural predatorial instinct to chase, kill, and eat, the dog will will opt for your reward. So if you put the dog on a sit and you tell the dog, come, and you have a treat, the dog's desire for that treat will outweigh his natural instinct to be lazy and not come. So he'll come and he'll get the treat. Now, if you tell the dog to stay, And when he stays, he gets the treat. He'll stay because he wants that treat. But if a chicken or a rabbit runs by, and that triggers his natural predatory instinct to sight, scent, hunt, kill, and eat that rabbit, that will outweigh his desire to get the little treat from your hand. And that's where oftentimes positive training will fall apart. All right, I, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, pause that right there. Yeah. Okay. This is the biggest lie in dog training that positive reinforcement doesn't work. And, and they love to use the example of, hey, your dog is an animal. Yeah. And it's got prey drive. Yeah. And when, like you said, if a rabbit or or something like that, a squirrel comes by, yeah. your dog's not going to care about your little treat. And and I have two things to say about that, Will. Uh, firstly, I want to say for those of you watching or listening at home right now that maybe have not been following us for years, uh, that this is your first time. Uh, really learning about us, or maybe you've only been around for the last couple of weeks. Um, Will and I are ex compulsion based trainers. Exactly, we both are. We we both are. We used to we used to hate 
on purely positive based yeah. training. We genuinely did. If you watched our old episodes on this podcast, then you know that that is true. However, science, education, and learning and experience, experience doing it has shown us that we were wrong. And I'm willing yeah. to admit to that. Yeah. We were wrong. And and one of the most important things is continuing education. Absolutely. Okay? And so Absolutely. it's one thing. It's one thing if there are positive only force free trainers that have never used negative reinforcement, yeah. never used punishment, never <laughs> used an aversive. And for them to be saying, hey, you don't need that, right. that you can get the results you're looking for just using positive reinforcement training. Right. They're like, yeah, you don't know what you're talking about. But that's not the case here. It's not the case here because no. there's no way, there's no way we've been there, we've done it, and yep. we have client after client after client that we have not had to use negative reinforcement. We have not had Precisely. to use punishment. Now, exactly. I want to show show everybody something. OK, so here is Fetchmaster's school of dog training. OK, mm, and Fetchmaster's, OK, is a training program. All right. And they've got let's go down. Let's go down. Where is it? Oh, I missed it right here. Um, Right here, positive gun dog trainer certification what? program. Positive gun dog? Yeah, so so let me ask you a question. All right. So Robert there, yeah, he's saying that listen, if prey goes by, yeah, you're you're gonna lose your dog. You 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 have to use corrections because any other animal that's gonna run by. Any distraction that's out there, especially if it's, you know, a squirrel, um, a rabbit, um, yeah. how about birds, okay, Yeah, uh, that you're going to lose control of your dog, that you have to use corrections, that positive reinforcement training, force-free training can't get the job done. Well, how in the world, how in the world is it that – they're able to do that. And these dogs are off leash. Yeah. Okay. They're off leash and they're around all kinds of other animals. Prey. Yeah. There's all <clears throat> kinds of distractions that, um, that are out there, but I want to show another one here. Here we go. Positive gun dogs. Now this is a private group right here on Facebook. Yeah. There's, 2,700 members of the positive gun dog group. So to say that you have to use aversives, you have to use corrections because the big distractions around prey, positive reinforcement fails. No, it doesn't. Yeah. It's happening all the time. All the Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Okay. See, what, it, what it's about, Will, it, here's the thing, and we used to say it all the time, that positive reinforcement will get you there, aversives get you there just a little bit quicker, um, and, and the thing is, when you have a positively trained dog that is being distracted by a bird, a lizard, another animal, any distraction. It's not because your training was wrong. It's because you haven't done enough or proper training yet. You know, uh, Robert Cabral in that video, he goes on to say that a positive reinforcer trainer is going to have their dog sitting there and they get up and they walk away and I'm just going to ignore that behavior. And then my dog comes back and sits down and then I give my dog a treat. Firstly, that's not the way that I train. I'm pretty certain that's not the way that you train, Will. That's not the way that the majority of good, positive trainers train. Because what happens is, Mr. Cabral, and for anybody that thinks that positive reinforcement just doesn't work, is I do use the other 
quadrants of operant conditioning even when I'm not using an aversive. I when my dog when I'm training my dog, I put them onto a constant reward schedule. And for those of you at home that don't know what that means, it means every single time that my dog does the right behavior, it gets rewarded. It is constant. It is every single time without fail. Now, my dog, I told my dog, sit, stay. I give my dog a treat. A bunny runs by. My dog gets up and goes after the bunny. Then my dog comes back and sits down. What Mr. Cabral is saying is that I'm now going to give my dog a treat because they sat back down. Wrong. I'm not going to because that's not the task that my dog failed. My dog did not fail at sitting. He already sat. He failed at staying under distraction. That's oh, what he I'm failed gonna at. Say, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say yeah. the dog didn't fail at all. Ah, I'm going to okay. say that the trainer failed the dog, that the trainer set the dog up for failure. Okay, and, yeah. and here's here's the bottom line. OK, I have no doubt if you've got a dog with high prey drive yeah. and your brand, you just start training your dog. And yeah. you've not done any distraction training. And now all of a sudden you're asking your dog to sit and stay and a rabbit goes by. You're going to lose control of your dog. Yeah, I get absolutely. it. Absolutely, I get it. Here's counter conditioning and desensitization. Counter conditioning and desensitization is not just for changing a dog's underlying emotional state for fears Anxiety, phobias, aggression, and reactivity. Yes, that is primarily what we use counter conditioning and desensitization for. But when it comes to distractions, when it comes to things like if you've got a dog that wants to chase later on in the video, I'm not going to play it, but Robert will talk about dogs that you'll be walking and here comes a kid on a bike. Here comes a kid on a scooter and the dog wants to chase after them. Well, that's prey drive too. Yeah. But the bottom line is if I'm new to training my dog, I don't, and I want my dog to sit and stay and focus on me when a rabbit goes by or when a kid goes by on a bike or a scooter. I don't start the process by putting my dog in that situation where, hey, that scooter or that bike is, you know, five feet from us. It's just zipping right next to yeah. us or we're right next to a <laughs> rabbit or a squirrel or something right. like that. All right. So then you, how do you do it? First of all, just like we talk about with using counter conditioning and desensitization yeah. for anxiety, fears, phobias, aggression, reactivity, you have to start at a distance where you have control of your dog. You Absolutely. start at a distance and you're proactively creating training situations. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have my dog and I'm going to be going through whatever exercises, training exercises I want to do. I'm going to have a kid on a bike. They're going to be at a distance from my dog where my dog can see the bike, but my dog is not losing its focus. It is still responding to the cues and commands I'm giving. Um, my dog can stay focused with me. It's not wanting to chase after the bike. And I've got this kid going back and forth on the bike at a distance slowly. And then eventually I start speeding up that bike, making it faster and faster. And little by little, gradually, systematically, as I continue to train day in and day out, I'm going to have that kid on a bike get closer and closer and closer and closer and closer. At any point, I lose control of my dog. That does not mean my dog failed, number one. It right. does not mean that force-free, positive reinforcement only training fails. It means that I'm failing the dog. I am working too fast, too soon. You don't yeah. go from zero to 100. You don't go from A to Z. There is a sequence and steps that you have to take. So here's the bottom line. When it comes to those trainers, again, it's the biggest lie in dog training yeah. that you have to, you have to use aversives, all right? Listen, either they're lying or 
They and and this is not an or; it's an and or. They don't have the skills. You know, Robert talks about, hey, I love positive reinforcement. Well, he's a very heavy compulsion trainer, all yeah. right? And the bottom line is this, is that you do not need to, when you do things the right way, if you understand, if you've got a high level of skill as a trainer, you can do this with force-free methods with positive reinforcement. Yeah. But you have to be a much more skilled trainer and you have to be better educated. All right. We had to go through the learning process. Yeah. All right. We went through the conversion process. You know, it happened for me almost by mistake because in mentoring you, I had mentioned, Hey, listen, the way that the dog training industry is going, I do believe down the road, you are going to have to be certified. And because the Certification Council for Professional Dog Trainers is really the only legitimate certifying body yeah. for dog trainers um, and the only independent certifying body, yeah. um, we went that direction. And, and I'm the kind of person, if I'm going to make you study and take a certification exam, I'm going to do it too. I'm not going to ask you to do something that I did. So I went through that process too. Well, part of the process of getting certified is there are ethical guidelines that you have to follow. There are ways of training you have to follow. And they're all about evidence-based, science-based training and force-free training, not using aversives. And so you sign an ethics statement saying, hey, I'm not going to use punishment. I'm not going to use right. a prong collar. I'm not going to use an electronic collar. Yeah. And throughout that process of certification, we're learning more about positive reinforcement and evidence-based, science-based training, force-free training, and how that is applied, not just to teaching a dog to sit, to lay down, to come when called, but how do you deal with big distractions? Right. How do you deal with a dog that's aggressive? How do you yeah. deal with a dog that is reactive? All right. But the biggest lie out there the biggest lie out there is that you absolutely have to use aversives. Now, here's right. another thing I want to share. Positive herding. Okay. Positive herding 202, advanced dog training. So wow. advanced dog training for herding. Again, dogs off leash around all kinds of distractions, around other animals, yet they're doing it all day long. Yeah. And, and, and let me tell you, herding dogs. Are in my opinion, in my in my opinion, you may you may have a different opinion. Herding dogs, cattle dogs, just dogs used for herding animals are some of the best trained dogs I have ever oh, seen in my life. By far. Ever. By like I mean, they are insane. I I when I look at these these good well-trained herding dogs these border collies <clears throat> these australian yeah. shepherds that yeah. that can herd a like three dogs herd a, a flock of or whatever the word is of a thousand sheep and they do it perfectly and to think that those dogs were trained with positive reinforcement only yeah. And you that, know, that, that hurts me. That hurts know, me as a previous compulsory trainer. You know? Do, you know, do you know where there's a lot of dogs being used for herding? It's in Europe, the yeah. countryside. Absolutely. Okay? And almost all countries in the European Union, shock collars and prong collars have been outlawed. Gone. They're banned. Yeah. They, they have to use force free training. Yeah. So, how is it? If they don't have those tools, how are they getting the results? So it must work. We know it works, but those yeah. folks that say, hey, there is no way you've got to use um, aversives. Yeah. Um, no, you don't. Now, no. let's go ahead and continue to share. And here we go. Let's get another one. Because it's time to put this to rest, all right? Canine Schutzen training, a manual for IPO, training through Wait, positive Schutzen? reinforcement. Absolutely. What? Training. I would never imagine a Schutzen dog to be positively yeah, they reinforced. Yeah, they call it IPO now, but, but here's the thing. Everybody says, oh, no, protection sports, man. You've got to use 
You got to use corrections. You got to use aversives. You know, there are trainers that are titling dogs yeah. in IPO, Mondo ring, French ring, using nothing but positive reinforcement. So again, the biggest lie in dog training saying that, Hey, you've got to use aversives when you don't have to use aversives. Let's just keep going here. Um, as I'm going through this. Okay. Let's, uh, take this to another step. Here we go. Training police dogs and military dogs using positive methods. These yeah. police officers, these police officers are proof that reward based training is good for more than just basic obedience and fun tricks. So the Seattle Police Department, Seattle's um, canine unit, they train with positive reinforcement. So again, another example, and we can just continue to go on and on and on. It doesn't end. Let's go to one more. All right. And uh, where is it? Oh, where are you? Here we go. Here's the next one. Work with a skilled positive reinforcement service dog trainer. This company does service dog training. Positive reinforcement. Now, I want everybody to think about this. I want everybody to think about this. I'm thinking. And I'm not talking about the fake service dogs. I'm talking yeah. about the real service dogs. Yeah. All that right. grinds my gears. We can talk about that at different times. There <laughs> are, but here's the thing. Most people don't train their own service dogs, yep. right? Most people, yep. they get a grant, they get money, they do a GoFundMe account, something like that. Yep. It costs a lot of money, it especially does. if you have a very complex um, set of tasks that the service yep. dog needs to do, like um, um, for people that are blind. I mean, that's a really yep. tough, um, there's a lot of training that goes in there. Yeah. I don't know of any schools throughout this country and even in the United States that train service dogs that use aversives. Yeah. All of them train with positive reinforcement. How is it that service dogs can go everywhere? And I'm again, I'm talking about real service dogs because yeah. there's a lot of fake ones out there. Yeah. And you know the fake ones because they're not well behaved. Yeah. No real service dog goes into public. And they're not well and behaved. He's jumping on on a on some random person, pulling yeah. to to play with another dog. No, that, no yeah, service dog that, is doing that. That's a fake service no. dog. Yeah. All right. People just they don't want to pay, and they want to take their dog in the restaurant. They don't mm -hmm. want to pay to have their dog. They want to be able to fly with their dog. Yeah. yeah. I love when I fly with Harley, and after the flight, the flight attendants come up to me and they go, "You have the most behaved service dog we have ever seen." And every time without fail, I look at them and I say, that's because she's a real service dog. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, bottom line, herding dogs. Yeah. Police canine dogs. Dogs that are doing protection sports. Okay. Service dog, gun dogs, hunting yeah. dogs. Okay. All of those, all of those dogs being trained to a high level of training off leash reliable with insane yeah. distractions around them. They don't have to use a shock collar. They don't have to use a prong collar. They're yeah. getting the results. So anybody that says, you know what Robert says, let's see, what does he say? I am saying the use of aversives, the use of corrections, the use of information in training a dog is necessary. Anyone who tells you anything else is lying to you. That's the lie. What he's yeah. saying is the lie. That is the biggest lie in dog training. Absolutely. Now, I want you to also to understand that there are trainers, people, lay people that love to compete with their dogs in dog shows. And I'm not talking about the beauty pageant, okay, where they're just prancing around the ring and best in show. I'm talking about working dog trials. I'm talking yeah. about... AKC obedience yeah. matches, whether it be in obedience, whether um, we're talking utility, okay, whether we're talking scent work, all right. All but today, anybody that competes with their dogs in AKC obedience matches, where they're putting titles on their dogs, there's lots of distractions. I mean, really advanced levels of training. They're using positive reinforcement. They're not using aversives. How Absolutely. can they get their dogs trained to that level? title their dogs 
around and, and have them reliable around all those distractions and not use aversives. Yeah, um, especially if aversives are necessary. Hey, right? Susan Garrett, Susan Garrett, OK, one of the best agility trainers in the world. Matter of fact, she's a world champion in agility. Yeah, she trains all of her dogs force free, total yeah. positive reinforcement. Now, one of the arguments, one of the arguments that, and, and, you know, Ivan Belabanov always gives this argument. He goes, it's natural. Corrections are natural, that it's part of our biology that we're pre-programmed to want to move away from things that are painful yep. and move towards things that are pleasurable. And he uses the example, hey, you, you touch a hot stove, poop, you, you quickly recoil from that. And hopefully you probably will learn from that. It hurts. You probably won't do that again. <laughs> and so he uses that example as, you know, the fact that it's part of our biology. and because it's part of our biology that we have to train that way. The other argument too, that they give, they love to give this one is that when you take a look at dogs, they correct each other. They correct yeah. each other with their mouth. Right. And mom dog does that too. All right. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. We have human intelligence. We have human intelligence. We're a lot yeah. smarter than dogs. Absolutely. All right. We don't have to use aversives. We don't have to use punishment like a dog because we have the ability to use our brain. And yeah. just like just like, for example, you know, I could take a rock and I could start banging nails with a rock and try to build things yeah. or I could use my brain and I could forge some new tools. Right. Absolutely. It's like, you know, for example, I could choose to walk or run from here to New York or Absolutely. I could get in a car or I could get in a plane or something. Like that. So there's more efficient, more effective ways. Okay. Less painful ways. Yeah. So no animal likes pain. No, that doesn't all. mean that it's some, and it is part of our nature, but that doesn't mean that as a result of that, that's proof positive. Oh, you've got to train this way because somehow that's the way the universe is designed. All right. And they'll, they'll say, you know, hey, roses have thorns. And, and do you know what propaganda is? Absolutely. I Let know me give you the best is. definition. Let me give you the best definition of propaganda. Propaganda yeah. is telling a story, telling something that has some truth to it. Yeah. And then you attach a falsehood to that truth. That's how propaganda works. Yeah. And so when Robert or other trainers say, yeah, positive reinforcement is great. You know, it, it builds the relationship with your dog. It's wonderful. You can begin to teach the dog certain behaviors with that. But then when you start getting into distracting environments, um, it's going to fall short. You've got to use aversives. Well, that's propaganda. Yeah. There's a part of it that's true. And then there's the rest of it that's a lie when it comes to this particular issue. And so this is the biggest lie in dog training. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Um, I've got some email questions that we can yeah. go through. If, yeah, if, absolutely. You know, I think we've them. kind of exhausted that. But before we do that, we need to take a second to hear from our sponsor. Please support our sponsors. Check out Calm Dogs. Oops, almost. Let's try that again. Where am I? Well, maybe we will. Dogs veterinary Slight. formula is a maximum strength calming aid with natural <laughs> ingredients made up of a proprietary blend of 21 herbs, vitamins, minerals, and amino acids that are clinically proven to reduce anxiety. Calm Dogs is five times more effective and has up to 80% more active calming ingredients than other leading brands. Making Calm Dogs the strongest and most effective calming aid for dogs anywhere on the planet. In double-blind tests, Calm Dogs is shown to reduce anxiety, fear, and aggression in up to 70% of dogs within 30 minutes of taking it, and 98% of dogs when taken twice daily for six weeks. Ask your vet for Calm Dogs today. Be sure to join the Calm Dogs revolution at calmdogs.com. 
where we help your dog <clears throat> learn the art of chill. All right, check out chill. Check out Calm Dogs. You can uh, get Calm Dogs at doganxiety.com. It comes with a 60-day money-back guarantee. Bottom line, Calm Dogs works for your dog or it's free. And it's not just about dog anxiety. Again, it's for dogs that have aggression, reactivity, fears, phobias, all of that. Um, Let me go to some email questions here. Um, This one is from Tina. And Tina is in Florence, Kentucky. And Ah. Tina says, how do I get my dog to stop jumping? It is so embarrassing whenever I have guests over. My dog is crazy, hyper, jumps all over them. And I'm very worried because if I have my grandmother over, she's... 92 years old and i'm really yeah. afraid that she's going to get hurt absolutely you want to take that yeah Jordan? i'll take that one jumping behavior is one of my favorite things to fix and the reason why will is because it's easy it's easy all right tina you so, just have to punish a dog right that's right all you're gonna do is you're just gonna take that leap no uh, but but what that's we're old doing, school, yeah, right? Yeah. How many times? Listen, compulsion based trainers they always say, "Hey, if your dog's jumping, knee him in the chest." Exactly, exactly. Okay. That is that, and that's what I was taught. That for yeah. for the longest time, for the longest time, that's what I did. And when people asked me, "My dog is jumping. How do I fix this?" I would say, "Knee him in the chest." Just take that knee and don't make it light either. You want to knee them in the chest. Make it make it uncomfortable. That's not how we do it, though, folks. Explain how it's done using so, force-free methods, absolutely. positive reinforcement only. So the first thing that we're going to do is we need to teach our dog an incompatible behavior without any distractions first. That's going to be the step one. Now, it... In a perfect world, the way that I like to do it is I teach my dog place, okay? What place is, is it is a designated spot, normally an elevated cot, something like that, where I'm teaching my dog to get on this spot and stay there. And I'm going to teach my dog to do that under distraction with light distraction, heavy distraction, and no distractions. Once I have a dog that is, you know, doing really good with place, There's something else I'm going to be doing concurrently at the same time, and that is what I like to call my 10-minute rule, okay? The 10-minute rule is very, very simple. When you come home, when your children come home, when your husband or wife comes home, when your neighbors come in the door, when your friends come over, whenever somebody walks through that front door for 10 minutes straight, you ignore your dog. You pretend that they do not exist. You're not greeting them. You're not petting them. You're not giving them a treat. The only exception to this policy is I've been gone for five hours. I need to take my dog outside to go to the bathroom. That's the only exception because I don't have a doggy door. But other than that, you completely ignore them for 10 minutes. Nothing at all. And I do mean no interaction. If you do this every single time that your dog, uh, that you come home and give it just two weeks, two (laughs) weeks of every time somebody comes through that door, they get zero interaction. You're going to start, what you're doing here is you're no longer reinforcing the idea in your dog's head that somebody coming through the door equals fun time, equals excitement. It equals love. It equals pets. It equals treats. It equals all these good things. Instead, the dog is going, huh? When people come through the door, nothing really happens. So that's not really important to me anymore. There's really no reason for that. Now, I've got my dog on place. I've taught my dog the 10-minute rule. And now I'm ready to start introducing the door itself. The first thing I got to do is I got to figure out what is triggering my dog. Is it, does my dog trigger when the person knocks? Does my dog trigger when they ring the doorbell? Is my dog triggering... They don't care when the knocking happens. They start triggering when the door opens. Exactly. Maybe, yeah, you maybe, need to know maybe that. they don't even care about that. Maybe what they care about is the moment the person makes it in the door. But you got to figure that out. Right. Once we know where my dog is starting to trigger, that's where I have to start desensitizing. So let's just say that I have a dog that triggers as soon as the knock occurs. That's where I'm going to start. Put my dog on place. 
And then I'm going to start knock, 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 knock very lightly, very light knocking. And I'm going to feed my dog simultaneously. High value treats, feed, 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 feed. And I'm only going to do this a little bit because we aren't talking about a dog that is fearful. We're not talking about a dog that is aggressive. I'm just creating an association so that my dog hears the knock and goes, ooh, I'm going to get some food. That's what I want. Now, and, the, and the dog is staying on place. Exactly. So it's and getting reinforced place. for that additionally. Exactly. Yeah. Precisely. Now, once I've got this association of I'm on place, someone knocks on the door, I'm getting food in my mouth. Now I'm going to start teaching my dog the desired task. Okay. And that is we're going to stay on place as long as somebody's coming through the front door. So now I have somebody knock. Maybe they jiggle the door a little bit. Maybe they open the door a little bit. My dog stays on place. I mark and reward. Okay. Then let's say the dog gets off of place. What am I going to do? I'm not going to correct my dog. I'm just going to have that person immediately stop knocking, immediately close the door, immediately step back outside, whatever it is. And then I'm going to reset my dog. Mind you, they do not get a treat for getting back on place because they got off. They got off. They broke place. Now that my dog is back on place, I'm going to do it again. The person knocks. They, oh, they get off a place. Well, nope, we're going to reset, do it again. Person knocks. They get off a place. Okay, you know what? This isn't working. My dog has failed three times now. I'm going to turn down my distraction. So instead of a, I don't know if you can hear this, like a loud knock, I'm going to do a, yeah, I can very, barely yeah, hear it. Yeah, barely like hear that. Very, yeah. very light knock. Very, very light. And hopefully, now that I've turned down the distraction, my dog remains on place. I reward them. And we use this very slow process until I get someone in the door. Now, what people are thinking at home is, well, Jordan, I just want my dog to stop jumping. I don't want my dog to stay on place while this is occurring. Like, I I don't, I don't want to worry about teaching my dog place. That's fine. What we have done now is we've taught our dog that someone coming through the front door is not an exciting thing. Focusing on mom and dad staying on place is a fun and exciting thing. So now we can remove place from the equation. Okay. Now I have somebody come through the front door. My dog already has an understanding of staying on place, being contained and not running over to jump. So now I've got my dog on leash. I let someone come through the door. And what am I going to do? I got to teach them a conflicting behavior, an incompatible behavior. Sit. Yes. Give my dog a treat. As soon as somebody walks through the door, person walks back out. I release my dog, let him run around. Person comes back through the door. Sit. I reward my dog. I do it again. Sit. I reward my dog. Sit. I reward my dog over and over and over and over. On leash, the reason why the dog is on leash is so that they never get to actually physically put their paws and jump up on that person. We don't want to allow them to repeat the behavior. We don't want to allow them to continue to reinforce this fun behavior of jumping. Now, I've had a point, come this point, my dog, someone comes through the front door, and there's probably a good chance that your dog is going to run up to you and sit and look for a treat. There's probably a good chance that's going to happen. If that occurs, you better pay your dog, reward them, lots of love, fun, explosion, give them all the treats, you know, and you're just slowly turning up this distraction of somebody coming through the door, going away, coming through the door, going away in addition to that 10 minute rule. And if you do those three things, which is 10 minute rule, teach your dog place with distractions, and then teach an incompatible behavior at the front door, you will see results very very, very quickly on the jumping behavior. I hope that answers your question, Tina. Was there anything that you wanted to add, Will, or did I kind of knock it on the head there? Um, you know, you you did good there. Um, the only thing that, you know, some of my clients, what I will um, have them do as well is use the door knock or the doorbell as yeah. a secondary cue for place. Yeah, perfect. Which is which and and uh I can actually explain that if you'd like, Will. So yeah, it's super do. simple. It's really simple. What I do is I'll have my dog on leash. This is super important, folks. 
Why don't we train our dogs on leash? I don't know. Start training your dogs on leash. Just put a leash on them. It makes things so much easier. And then you can extinguish the leash, get rid of it later on down the road. Now, my dog's running around on leash, and then I have somebody knock, 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 or ring the doorbell, and then I go place, 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 or sit, 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 whatever the whatever the command is, and then I reward my dog. And then I release him, knock, 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 sit, or place, reward. Knock, 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 sit, or place, and reward. And I do this over and over and over and over again, and then what's going to happen is it's going to go knock, 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 and my dog is going to boop, sit. Because they know what's coming next. They know what's coming next. We bridged the two together. Exactly. We turned the sit command or the knock into a bridge for the sit command. And what that means is a bridge is just connecting two separate behaviors. We're associating it. it. It's associative learning. It's classical conditioning. It's Pavlovian. Exactly. It is Pavlovian. That is exactly what it is. Um, and you know, I actually, I got a, I got a question. Um, the other day I had someone and maybe this is a a topic for, for another, another week actually. And I think it would be a good idea because it's already, we only have about 10 minutes left, but I would like, and those of y'all listening at home, I personally would like for us to potentially, uh, explore, um, the use of CBD in dogs. Is that something we could talk about, Will? I think that'd be a fun topic for us. Um, yeah, I think we can do that um, yeah. at, at another show. Yeah, um, yeah, I definitely, definitely think so. Yeah, so I, I'll probably leave that question for that show then. Um, but I hope that answers your question, Tina. I know that a lot of people, they have these dogs that are jumping when people come through the front door. Or we have door bolters. I think that's that's something else that I get a lot is door bolting. and. If you've got a if you've got a dog that sees that front door open and they just start yelling freedom and they're gone, listen up. Super simple, really easy fix. What we need to do is the exact same thing. Um where I've got my dog on leash, okay? And maybe I need to start 15, 20, 30, 40 feet away from the door, right? I'm going to open up that door and this this is great for a dog that is a jumper as well doing this training. Um I'm going to open up my the door. And what I'm looking for here is I'm rewarding the desired behavior. And that is the behavior of focusing on me, not worrying about the door, sitting and staying, whatever it is that I want my dog to do instead of going out of the door. When that occurs, I mark and reward, close the door, open the door again. If my dog could care less about the door, they're focused on me, they're doing my tasks, I'm going to mark and reward. I move a little bit closer to the door, and I'm going to do this over and over and over again until I'm right there at the door. Mind you, my dog is on leash. I'm now going to open the door, and I start teaching my dog that I will release them through the door, which for a jumper, this is probably another thing that occurs. You got a guest coming up. They're getting things from their car. I open up my front door. My dog bolts out the front door to go greet the guest. Now, I'm at the front door on leash. I'm going to open the door. I'm going to reward my dog as long as they don't go through the door. I'm just, uh, as soon as the door opens, I'm rewarding my dog. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is if I have a stay command built into my dog, I'm then going to give them that command, that cue, and I'm going to step out the door. And then I'm going to turn around and I'm going to reward my dog again. Then I'm going to Ask my dog to come through the door, whether that is with a release command, whether you build in your own command, your own cue that you want to use, whatever. I say break. I say break. My dog comes through the door. I reward her again. And then guess what? I'm going to turn around and I'm going to do the exact same thing to get inside. And then I'm going to turn around and I'm going to do the exact same thing to get outside. At this point, there's no distractions outside. Outside is empty. I'm just teaching my dog, you stay inside the the door frame. It's not really teaching the dog to stay inside. It's actually teaching them, don't go through door frames without my permission. That's what it's really teaching them. So now my dog is at the door. I reward. I release my dog through the door. I reward. I Or I step through the door. I reward. I release my dog through the door. I reward. And I do this over and over and over and over. Now I'm going to get a helper 
to be down, way down by the road, maybe even further. And I'm just going to have him stand there and I'm going to do the same thing again. Over and over and over, inside, outside, inside, outside, inside, outside. Then maybe I'll have that person move a little bit closer and a little bit closer and a little bit closer until they're right on my door. Now, this whole time, this person hasn't been moving. And then I'm going to do it again from that starting distance. And now I'm going to have the person start moving around, you know, maybe making noise, maybe trying to even call the dog, hey, Fluffy, hey, Fluffy, you know, like whatever it is, get their favorite toy, get some food, you know, make them jump up and down, bring kids into the picture. Distractions work with po- or positive reinforcement works with distraction if you take the time to do it. And and that's key. Okay. That is key. You know, there's a lot of people that are lazy. Yeah. And you've got to take the time. And here's the thing I want everybody to think about. Okay. And and this is not to shame anybody. How much do you love your dog? I I love my dog a lot. And do you believe your dog's a sentient being? I absolutely believe my dog is a sentient being. So your dog feels pain. Your dog feels pleasure. Yes, 100%. Not just, not just the physical sensation, but the emotional aspects yeah. of pain and pleasure. Right. Okay? Do you want to? I mean, think about this. Think about this. Let's say, the, Jordan, the average pet parent who gets a dog and they want to take their dog through training yeah. How long are they typically? And they, they don't have any major problems. They just have nuisance behavior issues yeah. and they want just regular obedience, you know, heal, yeah. sit, come down, go to your place. How long would you say that a person trains? I would say the average that a person is going to train is going to be no more than a couple of weeks. No more than a few weeks is what the average pet parent is doing with their dog. How many weeks? Animal. How many weeks? Uh, I'd say maybe four. All right. So four weeks. And how during those four weeks, how often would you say they're training? Um, Are we talking about how often I would do it or how often I think they are doing it? How often do you think a a, a typical pet parent is training? Probably once a week, week, twice a week. Yeah, I would say so. Absolutely. People are lazy, Will. People are lazy. I was going to say more like about five times a week. Yeah. Okay, but, you know, I could be wrong. Now, we know that that's not enough training for things to be fully reliable. Yeah, absolutely. All right, and so then what happens is they've got a dog that's situationally trained. They've got a dog that's partially trained. Yeah. And even though training's never over, folks, but then they get out in the real world with their dog, and they're struggling with their dog. Yeah. All right, because they haven't put in the time. But yeah. I want you to think about this. All right, let's split the difference. So let's say that for four weeks, all right, they're doing it four times each week. Okay, so they're doing basically what, 16 sessions? Yeah. All right, they're doing 16 sessions. And then after that, we know that they're not reliable. And so then it's day in and day out. So how long would a typical training session be? Um. Well, for, for average, me, for, no, for an average pet parent, uh, do you think? 15 to 25 minutes. I'd okay. Say. So for 15 to 25 minutes during that process, the dog's experience with their pet parent, if they're not using force free methods, if they're not yeah. using positive reinforcement, the dog's experiencing physical and emotional pain. Yeah. To a certain level. Now, I'm not saying you're abusing your dog, that you you know, you should be arrested for abuse and neglect, okay? Yeah. But a correction is a correction is a correction. It's just a politically correct word for, <laughs> uh, you know, punishment. And punishment yeah. means that, hey, something uncomfortable is happening. Yeah. All right. So if you love your dog, if you believe your dog is a sentient being, how comfortable are you day in and day out or at four times a week over a four week period of taking your dog and putting your dog through a situation where they experience emotional pain and physical pain, uh, you know, some intimidation, or at least they're uncomfortable. Yeah. If you love your dog, if you believe they're a sentient being, then to me, this is a animal welfare. This is an ethics issue. And that's what it became for me. 
Yeah. As I went through certification, as I had to do continuing education. Okay. Um, because, you know, those exams weren't easy, especially the uh, behavior consulting exam. Um, and, and so you've really got to know your positive reinforcement yeah. really, really well. Um, and it was through that process that I kind of had a lot of hurt feelings thinking about my past training and how I trained some of my dogs in the past. Um, and I just can't do it. Yeah. I, I just can't do it. Knowing what I know today. Yeah. And I always tell people when I talk to folks, you know, that are talking to another trainer that is telling them, hey, you need to use a shock collar. You need to use a prong collar. You've got to use corrections. I always tell them, I say, you know, you don't know what you don't know. Right. You don't. I, I, I want to believe that trainers have good intentions. Yeah. Right. They're working with animals. I want to believe they have good intentions, but you don't know what you don't know. So here's the thing. Either they don't know what they don't know. Or they, and this is part of it, they don't have the skill level to be able to train a dog reliably off leash with distractions using positive reinforcement. Right. All right. Those are the two big things right there. Or they're lazy. Yeah. Right. And they want it done fast. They want it done fast. And hey, for nuisance behaviors, punishment can work fast. It can work fast, but there's fallout. And we know there's study after study after study that if you are, especially on a regular basis, using corrections, using punishment, using negative reinforcement, using mm -hmm. aversives, that it takes a toll on a dog. And we know that it increases anxiety. It increases aggression. Yeah. And do you want that for your dog? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Well, folks, we are out of time. That we'll be we back are. here. We'll be back here next Saturday. Yes, we're we will. Here at um, what is it? Twelve noon Eastern. Yep, twelve noon yep. Eastern. I always yes. get the times messed up because Arizona has a whole different. Hey, hey, we don't Arizona do daylight does it right. savings. We don't. You know, our time stays the same. That's right. And I always got to remember. Okay. Is the East Coast, is the West Coast, are they on daylight savings time? Yeah. Are they not on daylight savings time? But uh, 12 noon Eastern yes. Saturdays. Also, you can check out my YouTube page. Go to YouTube and check out Phoenix Dog Training. And check out my website at dogbehaviorist.com. There's about 90 some articles there. Uh, go to the menu, find articles, click on it. If you've got a problem, you're probably going to find an article that's going to help you with positive solutions to resolve those issues. So there you have it. All right, folks, listen, have a fantastic rest of your weekend. We'll see you next week. Yeah, we will. We're out of here.